everyone. This is the journey to an ESOP and beyond. So happy you could join us today. This is the podcast all about employee stock ownership plans, pre-transaction, post-transaction. And today we're going to be in the pre-transaction. Well, let's start off with this. I would like to buy a hamburger. 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 No, no, no. Let's break it down. I, uh, I, I would, 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 would. Like, 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 two, 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 bye, 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 a, a, hamburger, 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 hamburger. Okay, so far. Everyone to know that I have a French accent that I use every once in a while. It's something that I love to do. This topic today, like as I said before, is going to be about something that is very important. And then that's what I'm going to say. The very first thing I would say is that it's about negotiation or in American negotiation. Now, let me just say first, as I jump into the Pink Panther clip that we had with Steve Martin. The one thing about this clip that I think is interesting, first off, if you're French and you're listening to this, I'm sure you're going to be like, that is terrible. You guys don't even know how to be Americans who can speak with a French accent. I understand it's not very nice, but of course it is what it is. But no, the point is um, you would um, look at this and say, okay, well, look, um, why am I using this in to talk about negotiations? Because the negotiations in an ESOP transaction are very uh, interpretive in a language in a sense. Like, what, how does a negotiation work? Because it works in a way that is very um, appropriate for the trustee and the sell side. And so there's a little bit of a ridiculousness to it. That's what I'm going to get into. That's why I used this specific scene out of Pink Panther. So that's what we're going to talk about. And it's, I hope it, what it, what we're going to do today, I hope what it does is it just prepares you to understand what goes into um, the actual final negotiated sales price of your company with the trustee. So that's what we're going to do. Um, as we go through that, I'm going to go into some of the basics of that. And then I'm going to go into some nuances around negotiation. So as we move into the discussion around the negotiation of the ESOP transaction, what I'm saying to you, of course, in my French accent is we have to start at the beginning, the basics. Of course, the basics are this. The ESOP transaction is like an M&A transaction. It's like a merger and acquisition transaction in that there's a buyer and a seller. The difference is that the buyer in this case is, is purchasing the shares of stock from the sellers to be put into a trust that gets released to the employees. And so that that right there means that it has to follow, because it's a retirement plan, has to follow and be in accordance with the Department of Labor process agreement. And so the trustee is the individual or institution, as we start thinking about who the trust trustee is because they're the buyer and we want to describe at the front end of this is they're who they are and how they go about what they're doing. And again, comparing that to just a regular M&A transaction where in an M&A transaction, there's a buyer and there's a seller and that the buyer in a, in a, just a normal transaction is really more of a financial um, standpoint. They're just building a financial deal and they're looking at it from how much can I pay? And the seller's looking at it from how much do they want? And on the ESOP transaction, what we're looking at are other things too that are important. And what, why this is so important is because it's going to dictate the way an ESOP transaction is going to be negotiated. And it's, and it's far more 
complicated in a sense than just a, a straight up transaction, even though it might not feel as complicated. And I think this is where people get thrown off ESOPs because it's like, oh, this is way too complicated. I don't want to do it because um, I just don't understand it. Right. So that's what, that's what this podcast is all about is breaking this stuff down. So it's not like overwhelming because it's not that big of a deal when you get into the, to the, the parts and pieces and fully understand it. So the trustee is either an individual or an institution. Now, let me describe the trustees uh, from an ESOP perspective. These are going to be very, very highly focused in their, in their practice, in their career on employee stock ownership plans. You're typically not going to see a trustee who dabbles in this. And I would say that that's kind of true for the whole ESOP industry or professionals. So you're not going to see people dabble and hey i kind of do this on the side there's this is something that you either do a, a lot of or full time or you really don't do much of it and that's important because we want to make sure that the people we're talking about are experienced at this so when we're when we're focusing in on the negotiation side within the buyer side you're going to you're going to see that these are experienced people now the trustees are going to be from all walks of, of different professions and disciplines. And some of them are attorneys. Some of them are pen, pension plan experts or retirement plan experts. Some of them are um, CPAs. Some of them are um, department of labor people who have gone through the department of labor and they've, they've come out of that and they're now working for themselves. They put their own shingle out, so to speak, and say, hey, we're, we're a trustee. They're going to have insurance to protect themselves because they are a fiduciary. And as you ask them the question, like, what are you doing? How do you go about doing what you're doing on the transaction side? Really understand, number one, that they're, they're going to be engaged to do the transaction, and then they're going to be engaged separately to do the ongoing trustee work. And we're going to, we're going to delineate, separate those two things because it's really important. They are separate. Their job as the transaction trustee is to negotiate first of it's negotiating the fair market value of the stock the word fair market value in the valuation world it really is is very straightforward and very important because it's it's not just it's not something that we just throw around like hey it's fair market value you know that kind of thing it, it's very important because in valuation theory there there are um standards that are put on the definition of what fair market value is. Now, the trustees, because they are fiduciaries, and that means that they are responsible for the employee's retirement plan, if they do something really, really not professional or in a way that that overvalues or does something that, that jeopardizes the employees, then they've crossed the line of fiduciary and then they become responsible. So there there's a lot of liability when it comes to being a trustee and, you know, and so part of this, as I profile a trustee is so you understand who, who is it that you're negotiating with in the first place, right? And how do they go about that in order for them to make sure that they've done their job correctly and you know what to expect as you go into these transactions. And so the other side of it is, is that they're, because they are um, specifically serving the role as the buyer, they need to be represented by other folks. And you will see that, that pretty much all of them are going to have to hire an independent valuation firm that accompanies them on their part of the process of negotiating. And that's going to be important because they're number one, they're independent. Number two, whoever they hire are independent. What does that mean for the valuation firm to be independent on the, on the buy side? Well, it means that they have not done any work for the company to establish the valuation. Because as soon as they have done any work, to establish the valuation for the client. So let's just say this, this company um, is high, has hired a valuation firm. They've gotten a valuation for whatever purpose and reason they had before. If that same valuation firm is trying to do the work here for the trustee, that that is not going to fly. That's going to be, I would say, um, very risky for the sell, for the selling shareholders and for the company. And of course, for the trustee, you know, the trustee is willing to do that. That's, that's, um, now, why do I bring, bring that up? Well, I kind of bring that up as a sidebar just to understand, number one, how important it is to understand the differences between the buyer and the seller as we talk about the negotiations being an arm's length negotiation. 
how important it is from a fiduciary standpoint and how important it is to keep in mind that, that the negotiation has to follow a department of labor process agreement for the trustee to feel like they're, they're in a good position fiduciary wise. And, and as, and as much as that's important, the selling shareholders need to feel like they're in a good fiduciary position as well. So that's important to kind of make sure that those roles and responsibilities are set up correctly. If the transaction um, is, is, Rel- relatively small. And in some cases, the trustee would be willing to say, Hey, I don't necessarily need an attorney on our side. As long as they agree with the, the sell side's attorney and say, Hey, that attorney works. We feel comfortable with how they're putting documents together. If the transaction is, is, is large enough, then they're going to need on the buy side, not only the, the valuation firm, but they're also going to need an ESOP attorney to represent them as well. Some trustees will not do any transactions without attorneys, so that that's just kind of a non-starter for them. And so just know that that's kind of, as we talk about the negotiations, we're going to really just, as we set up the buy side, we want to make sure we know who these people are. And so now you have you have the buy side set up, and then the sell side, of course, is the sell side advisor, the selling shareholders, the ESOP attorney. And so when we think about the negotiations, we're going to say, these are the two parties that are going to come together. And then we're going to talk about the, so that's the what we're going to talk about the, how it works, how does this work? And why is this a little bit, um, you know, different than of course, a regular M&A transaction. And so the first part is that because there is a lot of scrutiny to these transactions and where's the scrutiny come from, where does scrutiny over an ESOP transaction come from? It comes from the department of labor investigating situations that are problematic, and those situations could lead to situations like the um, Department of Labor investigates, finds a problem, makes a claim, and then suddenly the uh, selling shareholders had have to kind of reimburse com- the company back for whatever the fiduciary trustees in trouble with the Department of Labor. They get in trouble. They get penalized. All those kind of things. So why does that happen? Why is that that a possibility with an ESOP transaction? And and why is it in in a in a sense, if you're doing this the right way, this is the other side of it, that it's not, it's not a major issue if it's doing being done the right way. Well, it's because the um, most of those cases, I would say almost all of those cases that come about are because the company was overvalued. And if the company is overvalued, then the, the, what's happening is that the buyer is paid too much money for the company, right? At the front end. And if that's the case, then who's in jeopardy? The employees that are, that are basically getting this plan. Um, the company's trying to pay out the overvalued valuation and all these kind of things that, so that's just something that, that we want to make sure we we're aware of and understand that that's going to make sure that the guidance on the, on the negotiation is done in, in the way we're going to describe it as we go through it. Now, when we're, when we're thinking about negotiations on the sell side and we, we leave the trustee for a second in their group, right? The sell side should be like this. And and this is what I would say is, is depending on where you are in your, in your transaction, if you're at the very beginning or you're in the middle of it, or you're kind of in the close, um, this is a little bit geared. This whole podcast is going to be, this episode is going to be geared towards more of the, the ESOP process and the pre ESOP part of the timeline. And so if you have on your sell side, a process of going through estimating what the negotiation is going to look like, I would say that's going to be critical for the selling shareholder to make a decision to step into this place of saying, Hey, I think I really do want to do this. In in many cases, um, that might be uh, a, the very first step that's going to happen is the sell side advisor is going to lead the shareholders through a process to estimate what it's actually going to sell for. Now, Keep in mind that that can be done in, in, I would say, a lot of different ways. But my opinion professionally is that it needs to be done centered on cash flow. And that means that cash flow itself from a valuation perspective and specifically like discounted cash flow valuation, which is the present value of future cash flows coming back to today's dollars, needs to be kind of the major the major part of the modeling itself in addition to understanding working capital, because I I do see working capital as something that, you know, could, if it doesn't get nailed down at the front end, could really um, change the amount of of purchase price at the end of the day, because the, a lot of closely held companies, working capital 
really varies. Some companies run everything kind of like vapor, just enough working capital to get through every month. Other companies, it's like they have just an incredible amount of working capital stuck in the company. And it's more of a non-operating asset that gets added back as part of the uh, valuation. So it can really swing the net number. So those are going to be important. The reason I, I focus heavily on cash flow on the sell side is because cash flow not only should establish the valuation, but it also should be because it also is part of the way that the company is going to pay back the money that it's borrowing. So it fits these two feet, these two pieces fit together. One of the things about negotiation that I normally don't ever have a, any anxiety about, and, and hopefully, our, you know, as we go through this with clients, they don't have anxiety about it because we're, we're building models at the front end that help to kind of balance out all of the parts and pieces of the deal in a negotiation so that when we get to that, we want to make sure that we've hit the, the right number. Not, you know, when I say the right number, Keep in mind, I'm saying that as fair market value because that's what the Department of Labor Process Agreement is going to say. They, and that's what the fairness opinion is going to say. And that's what the term sheets are going to say when we get to the term sheet is that the, the trustee is not going to pay more than fair market value for the business. So the reason cash flow and not just some multiple of cash flow you know, that got created by some market approach is so important or discounted cash flow is because it's reasonable to think that the company is going to have enough money to on an on a ongoing basis of creating cash flow to pay off the debt in a way that's sustainable for the ESOP. That means that the company continues to do what it's doing and it pays back the debt. The selling shareholders who do take risk in an ESOP transaction are not going to be um, risking like this incredible amount of money, hoping that the company, you know, hits their targets in order to pay off their, even their interest expense. So anyway, all that stuff fits together. You know, I think in a, in a way that's very holistic and, and important and responsible. So kind of saying all that, what we're saying is, is that you should be prepared for the negotiations at the front end and the dialogue that you have with the trustee and the valuation firm are going to be important. Now, the, the dialogue itself is going to be kind of memorialized before the, the negotiation in a presentation that should happen through the site visit, as well as all the information that's going to be plugged into the data room that the trustee and the valuation firm are going to want to download and really have access to understand everything about the company so that their work before negotiations is going to be complete and full, fully vetted out in terms of any questions that might exist. So that whole process of, of building out that presentation is really important. The site visit's really important, building out the due diligence files and making sure that, that the sell side advisor with the shareholders have answered all the potential questions that, of course, the trustee and their valuation firm are going to have as you go into this, this next step of negotiation. Now, one of the things about negotiation is that it, is ha it has to be documented in an ESOP transaction, and it has to be documented so that that if the Department of Labor were to look at the way that the transaction went down, there's a very clear and clean record for the trustee and their team to show, hey, this is how it worked. So what we're gonna what we're gonna walk through next is just the idea of of the step by step process of how that works to get to a final number. Now, when we say a final number, of course, we're alluding to the final purchase price number and what that is. But we also are also going to talk about final terms and conditions as well. And so in a negotiation, what happens is there's a very it's very important that the um, sell side obviously puts together a roadmap. And one of the things I always I always try to like prepare people for is how because because if we just literally got on the phone and made an offer to the trustee and they came back with an offer, we probably could reasonably get there pretty quickly. But what we have to do is we got to show the optics to the transaction. So because of that, our negotiation is going to be as the sell side advisor is going to be really the kickoff. And that's going to be the, the initial lead off or offer that we're going to have as sellers and, or the selling shareholders are going to have that is going to be memorialized in a term sheet. That would be a, a pretty legal document that would be constructed by the sell side advisor along with the ESOP attorney and along with input from the sell, selling shareholders. Of course, 
really because it's their company, nobody should do anything without the selling shareholders understanding everything in that term sheet. Secondly, nobody should be doing anything and releasing anything to the to a trustee without the selling shareholders approval of what that looks like. So as we think about that, what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through some of the negotiation points in general and then say, okay, then how does that actually translate, translate to the trustee and the trustee's counter offer? So categorically, there's a couple areas that we're just going to cover from a higher level standpoint, but don't need to kind of put this into a framework that can make sense to get through that process and get to the, uh, the final part of, of how that really works from a negotiation standpoint. The first part would be, of course, all the descriptor, the descriptions of the transaction, including who the shareholders are, the company, um, the trustee, naming all the different parties. That's going to be always important. And as we do that, the, the first part of what we would want to do is really nail down the initial offer on enterprise value. Enterprise value being the cash flow value of the company, which is probably the easiest way to explain that is this, that the, the valuation of we turned everything into a, a multiple of EBITDA, that would be what we believe the multiple of EBITDA would be on the, on the cash flow. So EBITDA standing for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So that multiple of EBITDA would, would kind of predict some level of, of enterprise value. Now that number is going to be in a negotiation is going to be, you know, of course, higher than what we initially modeled because we are wanting to make sure that the trustee has room because the trustee is going to come in with their number on the on the enterprise value, and that's going to be significantly lower. And this is where it would get a little bit a little bit screwy for people because they're like, oh, "Wow, we're way off. You guys are way off because you came in with something too high." And so, just just know that that is part of the language of negotiation, and that it is definitely about um, anticipating that they're going to be low, we're going to be high, and so. Then what happens is we start looking at some of the other pieces of that. So now if I connect the enterprise value to the other parts of the total equity value, the other thing that we have to do is we have to think about the working capital at this point. So there's going to be not only an offer for the purchase price enterprise value, but there's going to be an offer for the amount of working capital that needs to be on the books at the time of closing. So higher high purchase price low working capital, right? Because if I net these two together, that means I have a higher equity value as I go. The trustee is going to come in at a lower enterprise value and a higher working capital. So that's how those kind of work together. And again, all of that should be kind of modeled out so that it's really easy to track through the um, anticipated counter offers that are going to happen. In addition to that, what happens too is then we're starting to look at the structure of the ESOP. So part of the part of the term sheet would be, hey, this is how the ESOP closing is going to go. We're going to establish the uh, seller notes. We're going to establish the inside note. Um, we're going to uh, create the create the trust. Then that's going to move into the the inside note. It's going to move the stock over. So there's going to be some kind of sequence in the term sheet of a, about how the actual transaction is going to go and be conducted. Now, as part of that, we're going to be referencing in the negotiation what the seller notes are going to look like. And that would be once we know, and this is going to be just part of a normal deal. Once we know what the bank has decided to lend, we're, we know that the remainder portion of that is going to be dedicated to the seller notes. Now, in a typical S corporation, what's going to happen is you're going to have the triple a or the tax basis be carved out of the of the total seller note so that's going to be whatever's left over at the time of closing in your tax basis for an s corporation is going to be um, put together in a in a triple a which stands for accumulated adjustment account promissory note now that note's going to have its own interest and its own amortization if you decide before the closing to to distribute a lot of the excess um basis or working capital that technically is is similar to that. So if you just if you decide to distribute that, that's going to reduce basis and then you're going to have a lower amount of AAA. Most times you're not going to have literally zero AAA depending on how much basis the company has been keeping in the company has been keeping in. So so this is just a small little aspect. It's not as much about negotiation as it is to recognize that that's going to be part of the structure of the deal. That AAA note along with the seller note is going to have a representative interest rate. 
that'll be applied to it. The interest rate can be, at this point, is going to be either without warrants, just being a straight up interest rate, or it's going to include warrants. And so if it does include warrants, what's going to happen is that that interest rate with the seller note is going to have a an also a warrant negotiation, which is going to be negotiating the internal rate of return percentage on the total amount of the seller notes, comp, uh, the shareholders compensation for holding the seller note. What does that mean? That means that the, the seller is going to get compensated for both the, but for the risk of the seller note from the company for both um, in both forms in interest that they're going to get either on an a monthly, quarterly, annual basis based on the principal portion of the interest note, which is seller note, which is usually going to be subordinated to the senior debt. And then over time, what's going to happen once that seller note pays off, then the amount of warrant shares that are issued at the time of closing to the seller are going to then mature in the future. And then the seller is going to basically participate in the another part of their compensation for the risk of that seller note. That is all going to be calculated at the time of closing and then issued as part of the agreement for the seller note. So what's negotiated here, of course, is the warrant percentage on the internal rate of return. And so the sellers are going to want a higher number. The the trustees are going to want a lower number. Now, keep in mind, this is also in combination with negotiating the SARS, the stock appreciation rights, if they have them. The SARS are another form like warrants or synthetic equity. They're another form of synthetic equity that have a different purpose. The purpose of the SARS are to reward and incentivize and retain the key individual people that the company management decides typically always, almost after the transaction, but usually having some idea of who those key people are going into the transaction. The SARs are going to be negotiated based on the percentage of equity that they represent. So if it's a 10% equity, then they're going to take 10% of the total equity and synthetic equity, put that to the side and say, hey, these are these are SAR shares available to the key people. And so those SAR shares are going to be uh, monetized on a on a cycle, typically like five years, that meaning meaning that in five years they're going to pay out. They have nothing to do with the seller note. They have everything to do with how the individual key people earn those SARS, which are going to be vested both on retention SARS and also performance SARS. So all of that is going to be also negotiated. So the percentage of SARS is negotiated and the actual um, performance versus retention gets negotiated. And so in some cases, just just say in general, in most cases, you're going to have more performance-based SARS than you are going to retention SARS. Now, everybody likes that in a sense because it helps the key people get something where they don't have to invest any of their own capital. It helps the trustee feel like, hey, there's a good working team, key group of team members to help um, fulfill the, the company's um, EBITDA targets that they had in the discounted cash flow. And that's the EBITDA targets, as we talk about that, are going to be part of um, the negotiation as well, because that's going to be on the performance side, what the SARS are going to be used to, um, or how to, how they're going to be vested. If the company hits those SAR or those EBITDA targets, then they should be vesting. Now, the EBITDA targets that are going to be used are also going to be just grossed up a little bit over the 100% mark. And so that's also negotiable as well. So all of that is going to be negotiated. Um, and again, the same premise with this is that we're going to, this, the sell side is going to take in as, as much as they can at the front end. They're going to wait for the counter. It's going to be lower on that, on both of those sides. The um, next part of the whole, the whole negotiation really is about like, as we get, we talked about working capital. So we have that already established. Then it would be the um, looking at the, the governance and who's going to be running the company. So it'll be depending on the control sale versus a non-control sale, whether or not the board of directors includes an independent director or multiple independent directors. So if it's a control sale, there's, there's going to be a requirement for some type of independent director to be on the board of directors. If it's not a control sale, then, then the, then doesn't necessarily need that, but there will be a board of directors that run the company either way. And that's going to be part of the negotiations as well. Now, some of the nuances of the negotiation include things like um, whether or not the company needs to upgrade their financial statements, 
Um, there is usually a mandatory requirement for a fiduciary insurance policy that gets in as a beneficiary being the trustee gets put in place and negotiated. There's going to be um, obviously some some normal M&A types of reps and warranties and identifications that are going to exist in that term sheet as well. All of those things are going to be somewhat negotiable, you know, in the sense of, you know, what does that really do? How does the trustee really protect themselves in terms of what they purchased? There's going to be a, a survival period in that how long those identifications last. There's going to be a um, an amount of, of total maximum claims that they can come back in the event that there was a, a situation with fraud. And all of that's going to be um, kind of populated here. Again, in a negotiation, what we're going to do is, is try to get the best situation for the sellers. The trustees are going to try to get the best situation for them. And so going back and forth on this, what happens is, is those, that term sheet gets, gets fully populated and then vetted out by the, tr- by the sell side team with the sellers. They prove it. Then that kind of moves over to the trustee. Then they come back with, with their counter. Now, all that being said, one of the things that, that is possible is that, and this is something that just becomes something you need to think about. Timing of the transaction can be um, important as well as we as we start thinking about this next part and next point. Um, as the, as the negotiation kind of goes back and forth, what's important is what's being represented in the existing numbers that were put together. And part of that is is if the company is on, let's just say, generally on track to hit their forecast. I think that the pretty, I would just say pretty much if that's the case, the forecast and the discounted cash flow, all that's going to be pretty straightforward and clear. Then I think there's going to be a deal that has just literally some straightforwardness to it. There's no, there's no future adjustments to anything. It's just going to be pretty easy. Put it to bed and move on. However, let's say the scenario is that the company is Timing wise, they've got some stuff that isn't hitting, hitting their quarterly information yet or their monthly information. So it's going to be pushing towards the end of the year. Um, the more of a gap that we have in the 12 trailing months of information from what's being represented at the time of negotiation to where the company is projected to get at the end of the year, the more there's a gap there, the more possibilities for, um, a, a, different deal structure possibility. So this is going to bring into negotiation the idea of like, if I'm the trustee and I'm, and I'm building my models on, um, his, you know, cash flow, right. And it's going to be historical versus forecasted cash flow. And I cannot show with my valuation firm a, a consistent growth pattern between the historicals and forecast. Then I'm going to say on my side as buyer, I'm not super comfortable taking on the risk that if the company doesn't hit these targets, we've, we are in a position like we have overpaid for the, the stock. So one of the things I, we try to do is just be mindful of that, you know, and, and the timing is never going to be completely perfect. Sometimes you just nail it. It's like, wow, we're killing the forecast. We're just like way ahead of things. Other times we're, we're behind it. And one of the things that might happen is, is you may end up even re, re-upping the forecast in this process. If, if something really were to happen, let's just say you're in the middle of a deal and the company just lost a big company, a customer, right? That can happen. And I think the the best and only way to do that is to is just to disclose everything. Hey, we've we've gone through this adjustment. Here's our new forecast, and then just adjust the purchase price. Now, that could happen where the company's like, "Look, I think that's true." However, we are really confident that we're going to get this other piece of work that's in the pipeline. Um, we were told we got it. We just don't have the actual contract. So, if the customer, if the shareholders and the and the management are like, "Look, we really are still very confident in the forecast." Then the, the next thing that can happen is we can either include a clawback provision or a, a earnout provision. Those would be good ways to, to basically pr- help, I guess, in a sense, help protect the trustee from overvaluing the company, but at the same time, giving credit for the future cash flows that are, that are coming down the pike. So if the company shareholders and key managers have a lot of confidence that the company is going to hit those things, then those targets, then I think it's very appropriate to build a clawback in there where they can get to the purchase price that they f- they fully believe is real and then let everything adjust accordingly. And then the trustees okay because they have not put themselves in harm's way and or, of course, the retirement 
um, plan, which is designed and geared around the, the employees. So they haven't put the employees in harm's way. Um, the clawback and earn out are two different approaches. One is you're going to earn up. If you do hit that number, there's going to be a positive purchase price adjustment. In the clawback, there's more of a just a negative purchase price adjustment in the event. So you're going to start off with a bit of a higher purchase price at the front end and then claw back that. Usually what we're seeing are like three-year time periods. So you're going to go through a three-year horizon and then you know go from there to um, adjust accordingly. Now, I like that structure on the clawback a little bit better than the earnout, only because um, I would say that as a business owner, we're more confident that we're going to hit those numbers than not. It gives everybody a really strong target to shoot for. And I think when people have that in a company, I think it makes it makes a solid um, target plan for everybody to work through and back into, hey, quarterly, where are we at? Monthly, where are we at? How are we doing according to to those targets? And it's got something obviously connected and, and meaningful to everybody. So so anyway, those are those are important nuances to understanding that the way that those kind of deals can get kind of negotiated. Um, of course, there's a little negotiations around the bank and the other aspects of this as we think about it. But this was really primarily to, to deal with the negotiation with the buyer and the seller. And what I've described to you goes off with a counter and the seller counters, and it goes back and forth until there's a final negotiated deal. Those documents are going to be obviously um, held as part of the the package that the trustee has in order to show that this truly was an arm's length negotiation. So hopefully that helps you today understand negotiation a little bit better. If that was kind of um, brand new to you, then it's definitely something that you should look deeper into um, but but if all of that is done accordingly, the selling shareholders and the trustee, everybody involved, I believe, would be completely protected. And so, and anything it can happen from there. But that that really is the way it works. So, with all of that, thank you guys for listening today. And um, if you do have any questions, please reach out to us on our website at journeytoanesop.com. Please rate us um, as a five star rating if you know how to do that. And then um, we will see you on our next step on this journey to an ESOP.